Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Josh Rogan, and I'm Vice President of Federal Affairs for CCIA. Uh, if you don't know, CCIA is a technology trade association that has been involved in technology policy debates for over 50 years. And we are very excited about the extraordinary promise that AI brings. Uh, as you all know, 2023 is truly the year that brought the concept of AI into the lives of everyday Americans. But the truth is that AI has already been part of our lives for quite some time. Uh, technologies like machine translation, also speech and facial recognition are forms of AI that are already, already in wide usage. Uh, if you've used Siri or Alexa, you've already used AI. Uh, Self-driving cars, manufacturing robots already use AI. Social media companies use AI to monitor billions of posts that would be impossible for humans to review without computer assistance. As you all know, the White House and Congress are all undertaking a crash course on AI, and our discussion here today is designed for congressional staffers, and our goal is to give you a deeper look at some of the underlying technologies that are commonly used uh, for AI. Uh, if you want to effectively regulate technology, you must understand how it actually works. Uh, this can prove complicated in the AI space because it's not really just one type of technology, but a group of related technologies, and more on that in a second. Uh, we have a really great panel uh, lined up to educate and discuss these issues, and I will introduce them now. Uh, first, I want to introduce Hothan Omar, who is a senior analyst focusing on AI policy at ITIF's Center for Data Innovation. She has worked in London on technology and risk management and as a crypto economist in Berlin. And today she's gonna to outline some of the key AI concepts uh, that you need to understand if you're, if you're to understand AI. Second, we have Professor Jordan Boyd Graber from the, from the University of Maryland Computer Science Department and the Institute of Advanced Computer Studies. His research focuses on machine learning, specifically making it more useful, interpretable, and improving the interaction between humans and computers. Uh, he also participated in Jeopardy and finished second, uh, which is quite impressive considering he only used his human mind and not any AI. Uh, third, we are delighted to welcome Professor Sayef Savage from Northeastern's University College of Computer Science, where she directs Northeastern's Civic AI Lab. The lab studies public AI technology with a focus on empowering gig workers, federal governments, and NGOs. Professor Savage was also recently named as one of the 35 innovators under 35 by MIT Tech Review. Uh, lastly, I would like to introduce my colleague, Josh Landau, who is Senior Innovation Counsel at CCIA. Josh advises the association regarding patents, AI, and other innovation issues. He's also the author of a white paper on AI, re AI regulation that we will be circulating to all of you at the conclusion of this panel. Uh, so just how this is going to go today, each of our panels, panelists will make a a presentation that illustrates how some key aspects of AI technology works, and then we'll have time for some questions. If you have a question, please email us at liveqa at cciaanet.org, uh, and I think it's be uh, below me on the screen as well. Um, but let's get things started. I'm going to go ahead and turn this over to my colleague, Josh Lando, uh, to set the stage for our discussion. Thanks, Josh, and I'm so pleased to be able to join everyone today. Uh, I think there should be a slide up at this point. AI is a really powerful force. There is significant potential from this to reshape how our society works. Uh, analogous to really when computing became a widespread technology within our society. There are potential huge economic benefits. There will also be challenges. There are national security benefits and challenges. But it's important to remember AI isn't just one thing. It's a group of different related technologies with significant differences. And that matters because if you regulate one type of AI, but apply it across the board, you're going to apply rules designed for one situation to some very different situations. So recently, a lot of the press has been on large language models like ChatGPT or image-based transformer models like DALI or Midjourney. And don't worry about what those mean. The other panelists can give more detail on that. 
But those aren't the only forms of AI. There are other forms of AI already in use, widespread use, that are really important to keep in mind as you think about how to regulate AI. So as one example, one category is auto automated decision-making. This is where you have an algorithm making decisions, using rules and applying those rules to input data. And this has been used for decades now in a lot of different fields. Credit ratings are an example of this. Content moderation and keyword filtering, spam filtering, these are examples of this sort of approach. Uh, spam filtering has gone into other areas as well, but it started out this way. But also scheduling and queuing for logistics, making sure that the right products get to the right places for consumers and the right inputs get to manufacturers at the right time so that those products can be made. These are all examples of automated decision-making and they're already being widely used. Machine perception is another form of AI, and this is letting machines understand sensory input, understanding vision, understanding uh, hearing. A machine doesn't know how to do that naturally. They have to be taught through machine perception technologies. And again, there's a, a wide range of existing applications for computer vision, for speech recognition. Things like manufacturing lines, they use automated vision, uh, computer vision, to make sure that the product was assembled properly, to make sure that the right things are in the right places. There are wildfire prevention tools that look at drone photos of power line equipment and say, okay, this is the piece that you need to fix first because this is the one that's in the worst condition and is most likely to cause a wildfire. And that's really helpful when you have power lines in remote areas. You can send a drone instead of having to get a human crew out there, get a photo and get prediction of where you need to send that crew. There are flood forecasting tools that use satellite imagery and weather data to determine where it is likely that a destructive flood will occur. And there are accessibility tools that use text recognition to translate an image that has text in it, which if you're visually impaired is not particularly helpful, to actual text that a screen reader can read back to a visually impaired user. And there are things like automatic product description that take an image and say, okay, the text of what this image is, this image shows uh, this product. And this is actually uh, an example being used by one of CCI's members by Shopify, where somebody selling a product on Shopify's platform can say, okay, describe this picture of my product and generate an initial product description. There's also natural language processing. So machine perception might tell you that there's text here and even what that text is, but it doesn't tell you what that text means. And natural language processing is really more about understanding the meaning of human language. This is often combined with machine perception, uh, tools, translation tools like Google Translate or Apple Translate. So they do machine translation and that's natural language processing. But they also can use the camera on your device, which detects the text and turns it into text and then the natural language processing translates it. There are also voice assistants like Siri, Alexa, and Google Assistant that use these technologies and search engines that use natural language search like Google and Lexus. And finally, there's machine learning, which is really a set of techniques for creating AI. And there are other forms of AI too. These are just broad groups. Um, there are always new technologies and new techniques coming out. So don't take these as the only forms there will ever be, certainly. But machine learning is a set of techniques for creating AI, using large data sets to recognize patterns, to train an algorithm, to make some sort of prediction or decision. And this was used in the development of a lot of the tools we've already talked about. So some examples of machine learning based AI systems are the, the generative AIs that we've seen a lot of press on, like image transformers and large language models. And they've developed impressive capabilities in generating text and images. Uh, in fact, the white paper, some portions of it were generated with the assistance of ChatGPT. So it's being used in real world applications by me as an example. Um, so while many of these applications that we've just talked about might not hold the same level of attention as generative AI, they do exist and they're solving real problems. And we wanna make sure that those existing applications which show the huge potential that AI can hold if it's implemented responsibly, if appropriate risk management is put into place, we can generate those sorts of gains in all sorts of other areas of society. So I'm gonna pass it back to Josh R and I'll have more to say towards the end of the program. Thanks again for the opportunity to talk to you all today. Thanks so much, Josh. And uh, we can get started with our presentations. Uh, and we'll start with uh, Hothan Omar. Uh, go ahead, Hothan. Thank you so much. Um, and, and thank you to CCIA for inviting me today, um, because I think it's really valuable to discuss the important concepts about AI that are necessary, I think, to understand, uh, to make good policy. 
Um, and as Josh said before me, uh, we all know that AI models like ChatGPT are getting a lot of attention right now. And I'm, I'm excited to hear what my co-panelists are going to present on because they've got great technical expertise. Um, but I hope to be able to tee up this conversation um, in two ways. First, I kind of want to explore the broad ecosystem that these popular models live in. Um, and second, I want to kind of explore what it means for a system to be open versus closed. Um, so if we move on to the next slide, please. Um, I'd like to start with the ecosystem because, you know, as we said, while there's a lot of attention on the kind of um, foundation models, the kind of technical underpinnings and the social consequences of, of many of these models depend on the broader ecosystem. Um, and to keep it relatively simple, I think we can, um, you know, simplify the ecosystem into three assets, let's say. Um, you've got data sets, models, and applications. Um, and on this slide, I've given an example of, of ChatGPT, which is um, from OpenAI. Um, so at the data set level, we have um, the GPT 3.5 data set. That's an OpenAI data set. Um, at the model level, you've got um, the GPT 3.5. And then above that, that's, this is where the application layer, and I've put two things here. On the one hand, you've got this ChatGPT API, which is sort of like this middleware software that allows developers to integrate the power of that underlying model into their own applications, products, and services. So you've got um, OpenAI using that for the ChatGPT that Josh said he was just using, but you've also got all these other companies that are building on it. So Spotify um, are using um, the APIs and the underlying model in uh, their AI DJ. I don't know if, if any of you who are listening today have noticed that Spotify has now been curating their lineup of music. It's quite good for me. It seems to know me quite well. Um, but it's also, it's, it's curating the, the, the commentary alongside those tracks. And it's, it's using uh, this API and this underlying model to do that. You've also got Snapchat, which is using uh, this API and this underlying model to um, you know, create their uh, customizable um, chatbot. Um, Microsoft's Bing is also using um, ChatGPT to deliver better search, more complex answers, uh, a new chat experience, um, and the ability to generate uh, content. Um, so there's really various ways and various organizations that are, are using this underlying model. So there's really what I'm trying to get at is this, this um, broad ecosystem. It's, it's more than just the model. It's the underlying data sets and also the applications that build on top of them. Um, and I think it's important to understand this for two reasons. Um, at any given time, there are new data sets being built, there are new models being trained, and new products that are being created. Um, and it's not necessarily always clear. So, you know, when I'm using Spotify, I wasn't, I didn't know before actually making this um, presentation that that it might have been using uh, what models it was, what models it uses. Um, and I also think it's quite easy to get hung up on one company's model and the way that that company uses it. When actually, I think we need to zoom out and understand the broad context to truly grasp both the opportunities that are available and also the potential risks. Um, and I think it's useful to not only understand the technical relationships, but also the social relationships between organizations and the dependencies. Um, next slide, please. Um, and I'd like to add an additional layer to this ecosystem, which is about openness versus closedness. Um, and so when I say openness, I'm referring to when an asset, be that a data set or a, or, or a model or an application is, is um, accessible to the public and users can interact with it directly and freely. And when I say closeness, I'm referring to when that asset is not publicly accessible or when its usage is restricted to specific organizations or individuals. Um, so next slide, please. If we now go back to that same original slide that we had, um, but we look at it with this new lens, here we have openness in green uh, where you know there's limited access um, sorry, openness is in green, whereas limited access or closeness is in yellow. So if we go back to that um, ChatGPT example, I think there's a lot of articles that you might see that say, you know, this app has been unleashed on the world, it's an open system. But importantly, that is talking about the application layer. Anyone can access or use the website. And I've also put the API in green because for the most part, it's also open to developers, although they have to apply. Um, but the underlying model and the underlying data set aren't open. You need a license from ChatGPT to use that. Um, and that openness can also be seen um, at the app layer too. So Snapchat is open. Uh, Bing search is now open. This should actually be green. At one point it was closed, but now it's open. Um, but AI DJ, the Spotify AI DJ is not open. You can't just, without a license from Spotify, you're not able to, to access or use that system without them. Um, and so why do we care, next slide please. Why do we care about openness versus closeness? 
Well, on the one hand, openness has benefits because it encourages you know, widespread innovation and experimentation. Just think of all the apps that are building on ChatGPT. But it also creates a risk that that model or application could be used for bad purposes. So you can think of, um, you know, an organization or a nefarious actor using, um, you know, some of these models to generate phishing scams, um, to, you know, fuel disinformation, um, fake news articles, spam, or, you know, impersonate people. Uh, and then on the other hand, closeness on the one hand allows companies to kind of protect their innovations and their IP, but it makes it hard for researchers and the public to scrutinize those systems if we want to ensure that a data set is, for example, representative to ensure it doesn't perpetuate bias, we have to come up with some way to test that without, you know, forcing them to, to open up their system. Um, and so next slide, please. Um, on this kind of, this is my last slide, I, I just want to give a few more very simple examples of just how varied this ecosystem is. Um, these are just four examples of models, but there are hundreds. So, you know, we have this open AI example, but um, Bloomberg also has their own um, a large model. It's called Bloomberg GPT. It's a 50 billion parameter large language model that's specifically trained on um, financial data. And the underlying data set, FinPile, is um, uh, kind of financial documents, including you know, news and press releases, web scraped financial documents. That's in gray because it's totally locked down. You know, this is not something that's open. This is a totally closed system. Um, you, we've also got Anthropic, which is another example um, of an organization that is sort of a, a similar or a competitor to OpenAI. They have their Claude data set, the Claude model. They also have an API and they have um, applications like Assembly AI that are building on them. You've also got Meta that have their own data set um, and their own uh, open model. So I've just given four examples, but Stanford actually did some great work recently. Um, they had a paper and a website that came out in March of 2023 um, that completely kind of records all the different dependencies, all the different relationships, and it's a kind of ongoing project. And you know, when they came out with it back in March, there were 128 models, 64 data sets, 70 applications, 63 organizations. You know, it's this is just to show that you know chat gpt and open ai is just one model but we really need to be thinking about the ecosystem you know at large um and you know when you're thinking about policy policy can't just be focused on you know how do we regulate this what is this one organization doing what is this one like really i think we need to uh, think really comprehensively um i think i've been talking for long enough so i'll stop there uh, and hand it back over but i'm really excited to to, to do q a and, and hear what my co-panelists have to say uh, fantastic. Thank you. That was really, uh, really great. And uh, we're going to keep on rolling. And uh, Professor Boyd Graber, why don't you uh, take it from here? Okay. <clears throat> uh, great. Fantastic. Uh, thank you for the invitation. And so um, just to introduce myself again, I'm, I'm Jordan Boyd Graber. I help develop uh, models and, and work on evaluation of models. And I'm just down the green line in College Park. Uh, so if we go to the next slide, uh, what I wanted to talk about today is, is give just a little taste of what some of these models are doing. And I work on tech, so I'm going to talk about text models. And so in particular, uh, we were just talking about ChatGPT. It is a model that works on tech. So what are these models doing? And, and my goal is to kind of demystify some of the things that are going on here. Uh, I only have a couple of minutes, and so we're obviously not going to go into the details. Uh, happy to follow up. Uh, or uh, I also post all of my course materials online. So if you do want uh, the details, uh, uh, feel free to Google me and, and look up uh, my course materials. All of my lectures are, are there. Okay, so chat GPT, all of the GPT models are autoregressive language models. And so what does that mean? All that means is that they work by predicting the next word. And you probably see this when you run ChatGPT. It does a show of, of going word by word and generating them. And, and that's how it works. And, and there's nothing magical uh, about that. And uh, this idea, uh, as we see on the slide, uh, what's a language model, dates back a long, long way, all the way back to uh, Claude Shannon, the father of information theory, he played this game with his wife trying to predict what is the next letter in a long sequence. So let's play a little bit of that game here. And uh, we can see, uh, so we have a, a snippet from a song here and try to predict the next word. Um, uh, last night I walked into my bathroom and stepped in a big pile of sh and the answer obviously is shaving cream. Uh, and 
Uh, so I, I, I give this example because it's fun and it, it kind of shows all of the things that you need to do to make these sorts of predictions and the kind of information that models like ChatGPT are able to leverage to do this. So like, think about what you have to do to predict the next word. So this is a song, so you might look for things that rhyme. There's also contextual clues, like what would you find uh, in a bathroom? What could be in a pile? And so all of this information is going into making a prediction of a language model. And this information is useful uh, because you can change this into a lot of tasks. And uh, this allows you to have interactions with a language model, a lot like the conversations that you would have with a person. But it's important to remember that these things are only making contextual associations. They're predicting the next word and they're able to generalize from a lot of data, but it's still just machinery for predicting the next word. And we've had this machinery for a long time. It's just that it's gotten a lot better in the last couple of years. So if we move on to the next slide, I'd like to talk a little bit about what changed. Uh, what is the magical uh, secret sauce that caused this explosion in the last couple of years? Um, so first off, uh, this has been a slow and steady development. And so it may seem like everything has changed in the last couple of years, but for, for people in the field, it has been fairly gradual. Um, and and it, it's great that everyone is suddenly excited in this stuff, but uh, we've been working on this for a while. Um, and so uh, we went from just counting words uh, in the 90s to using things called log linear models uh, that turned words into features. So you, you looked at the ends of words and things like that, and you tried to create patterns from the ways that words ended. The One of the big changes was that in the early to mid uh, teens, uh, we started using deep learning to do language modeling. Um, and so uh, some of the earliest models, uh, LSTM, RNN came out then. And, and the big revolution there was one, using nonlinearities from deep learning. And a parallel revolution that also happened in the early to mid teens was doing representation learning. Um, and so instead of having words stand for themselves, so uh, dog being D-O-G, we would turn dog into a vector. And I'll talk more about that in a second. And then uh, the big changes that uh, I, I think more people pay attention to are the transformer and uh, uh, fine tuning of, of large language models that we saw in, in the last five years. And at the same time, uh, not to be overlooked is we had big changes in hardware, software, and data. Uh, we've been able to use GPUs for hardware acceleration. Uh, we now have frameworks called computation graphs that allow people to quickly develop these models. And so back in the old days, uh, I, we would torture grad students by making them uh, compute derivatives by hand. And for anyone that, that took calculus, that ain't fun. Now the computer can do all that work for you. And that really sped up the, the rate of innovation here. And, and then uh, going back uh, to what Hoden was saying, like we have large open data sets. And so uh, that allowed us to make huge progress uh, because we could share data sets and reproduce results. And, and that made uh, a lot of these revolutions possible. Okay, next slide. Let's talk about turning words into vectors because th this is an important part of uh, what happened. Uh, why we were able to make big advances. And so uh, text representations, the primary example of this was Mikolov et al. 2013 word to vec And so the basic idea here is that you can uh, take some of these large open data sets uh, like Wikipedia, uh, run it through a computer. And then when you put in dog or cat, you get a vector out of it, a series of numbers that encodes what a word means. And so the, the nice thing about this is that you can uh, plot on a map where all of these words live and words that have similar meanings will be close to each other. And this is a huge advance. Instead of uh, we now have ways of saying things that are similar to each other or like each other that we can compute easily on computers. And so uh, moving to the next slide, the, the next building block on top of that was to not just do that once, but to do it many times. And uh, you may have heard about transformer models. This is uh, one of the building blocks of GPT and uh, the BERT model uh, that came uh, before it was that you, you would have a bunch of these vector representations of words, these lists of numbers that represent first what words mean and then what sentences mean. And the, the key innovation here is to do this many times and to have uh, this 
uh, attention mechanism that allowed you to look at uh, large parts of the input space. And one of the bottlenecks before this innovation was that uh, we were processing text left to right, uh, like a human. And that made sense uh, when we didn't have uh, large computational power. And it also made sense from kind of a psychological perspective. Uh, but uh, a lot was unlocked by uh, using this, this uh, crazy e equation here. Uh, there, there was an interesting Twitter thread about, we haven't added new uh, equations to God's book of equations in a while. And uh, this was one of the nominations for uh, one of the new equations we should add to the list along with Maxwell's equations and E equals MC squared uh, because it unlocked such uh, huge new potential. Uh, next slide. But uh, despite all of that, we, we, we should not forget that uh, we are essentially just predicting the next word. And so there is no magic here. We are using previous texts to predict the next word. And there is no evidence that, that things are slightly conscious or uh, have free will or anything like that. Um, it's mostly patterns. And all of this has happened before. It will happen again. There was a similar uh, excitement about AI in the 70s and the 90s. Uh, here, here is a nice um, take on that in the 90s. And uh, uh, if we uh, progress, uh, this also happened even before computers. There was the phenomenon of clever hands, a, a German horse that people believed could do math. And we want to see thought and we want to believe. Um, and we, we should be skeptical of claims uh, that aren't founded on uh, empirical investigations of what these models are, are happening. And I, I want to emphasize, Hoden was completely right, we need to have openness so that we can do these sorts of evaluations and make uh, well-validated uh, statements that withstand scrutiny. And so moving to the next slide, um, I, uh, I, I, I want to kind of uh, do a little bit of log rolling for the University of Maryland and what and talk about the way that I like to refer to these models. And so some people call them large language models. Some people call them uh, foundation models. Uh, my favorite uh, way to refer to these models are Muppet models. And so if we could advance once, uh, uh, Jim Henson went to the University of Maryland, got his BS degree. Uh, Mohit Iyer uh, got his PhD here, my former student, uh, Jacob Devlin, uh, MS student, and if we could advance, you can see that they all had their hands in Muppets. Uh, Mohit developed the Elmo language model, uh, Jacob Devlin developed BERT, and I think Muppets are a fun way of thinking about this. They're really smart, they're creative, but you shouldn't necessarily take them 100% seriously because they make stuff up. Uh, but they're sometimes useful. And I learned a lot from Muppets. If we go to the advanced slide, um, just as a bit of trivia, if uh, GPT was originally going to be called Snuffleupagus, a large model that not everyone uh, can see, which I, I think is a good uh, way of thinking about uh, kind of the closed nature of uh, chat GPT. Uh, but uh, OpenAI chickened out and uh, didn't call it Snuffy. Uh, they called it uh, GPT. Um, OK, and, and then uh, going to the next slide. Uh, one of the things that I'll, I'll mention is because we're using these vector representations, it allows you to go multimodal because same, the same thing is happening in the vision space. And now we have vectors that make sense for both uh, text and language. And um, just to uh, going to the final, final slide, um, just a final bit of log rolling. I do trivia competitions between humans and computers. I think it's a fun way of uh, understanding the relative strengths and weaknesses of machines. Um, we have videos from the previous iteration that we ran in 2018. We're doing it again this summer. Uh, if you're in the DC area and want to check it out, we're in College Park. Uh, you can go to this webpage and, and find out more, and we'll be promoting that. And uh, happy to see you there and looking forward to uh, uh, failing to answer uh, some of your questions. And I'll turn it back over. Thank you so much, uh, Professor. Really appreciate that. And uh, for our final presentation, uh, Professor Savage, uh, it's all yours. Thank you so much. It's such an honor to be here today. Um, actually, yesterday I passed my US citizenship exam. And so right now I'm very fresh with everything about Congress, the Senate, the House of Representatives. And so this is such a delight uh, to be here. So um, I'm Professor um, Saif Savage, and today, 
we're going to step back a little bit and we're going to learn about some of the basics of AI and start to understand also the types of harms that can exist when we're deploying AI systems in the real world. And for me, that's particularly important so that you can identify how these types of systems could create harms in citizens and what you can think about in order to combat those types of harms. And this is going to complement a lot of what um, o um, uh, Dr. Omar was presenting and also um, what Professor um, Jordan was also presenting. So let's start. Uh, next slide, please. So overall, let's first give an overview about what exactly is AI. AI is a science that focuses on enabling machines, computers, to start to think like humans. They want to create reasoning in machines that is similar to humans. Now, within this area of AI, we have different subfields. One particular subfield is machine learning, which focuses on the ability of having machines be able to learn from experiences. So you give the machine certain data, from the data it's going to start to learn, um, for example, certain patterns, and then from that it's going to be making predictions about what will happen in the future. Now, within this area of machine learning, we have deep learning, and then we have a very popular concept that is generative AI, which perhaps several of you have started to hear about. And uh, for example, the two other professors that came before me were also discussing a lot about uh, generative AI, for example, ChatGPT, et cetera. And so this type of AI focuses on learning from experiences. Next slide, please. Now, Within this area of, a, of machine learning, this is the general pipeline about how it works. Usually you get data, you clean the data, and then you give it to your machine learning model, uh, which also Dr. Omar was talking about how it was very important to understand that different companies can have different data and different models. The key thing to understand from this is that this is a standard um, pipeline that exists, and you can have different data sources through which you can teach your machine different things. For example, you could teach your machine, oh, um, you know what? These are photos of cats. These are photos of dogs. This is the label that you wanna give uh, when you see photos of cats, for example, maybe kitty. And this is the label that you wanna give when you get photos of dogs, maybe puppy. Um, another thing that you can do with the standard model is well, you know, this is how teenagers are usually uh, talking. This is the vocabulary that they use. This is the vocabulary that people from the South use. And so based on that, um, you can then teach the machine to talk to, for example, teenagers in, in the language that teenagers are accustomed to. And this way uh, you maybe have a chatbot that is much more approachable. Or for example, maybe you have immigrants and you want to create a chatbot that can talk to immigrants in also a language that immigrants will be more comfortable with so that they'll use and engage with the chatbot much more. And so this way you can teach the machine to start to learn from the patterns so that it can replicate what humans are also saying. Next slide, please. However, something to consider is that um, you would say, well, that that workflow sounds perfect. You know, we're going to have machines that are going to be learning things um, and we're going to be able to deploy them in the real world, such as ChatGPT, and create these amazing and powerful interactions. However, a big important thing for you to be aware of is that you are always working with uncertainty and um, unpredictability. Why? Because at the end of the day, the machine is making predictions. You give it data from the data, it starts to learn patterns and it's making predictions about, for example, in the chat, in the case of ChatGPT, it's making predictions about what is the next best word that it should be using given this particular context. Given that it's using predictions, it can have errors. And so it, it has probabilities. And so this brings in uncertainty, unpredictability. Unpredictability can be joyful in one experience, it's surprising, but in another case, it can be a terrible idea. Next slide, please. So for example, Google started to integrate AI in its systems for categorizing photos, and it would automatically categorize photos 
in people's phones and put in certain tags. For example, oh, these are photos of skyscrapers. These are photos of airplanes. These are photos of cars. And Google thought, you know what, this is gonna be great for people to be able to go through their photos in a much better way. However, what happened? Suddenly, um, a black individual realized that Google was labeling his friends as gorillas. The photos that he had of his friends were labeled by Google's um, AI as gorillas. And so this is an example of where the AI created a failure and it was a severe failure as it was calling humans um, gorillas and considering also historically uh, what black individuals have gone through, um, this was even a, a, a much greater harm. And so this is an example of unpredictability and harms that can emerge with AI. Next slide, please. Now, another example is the example of Microsoft's Tay. Um, uh, maybe some of you have been familiar with it. Um, and 20 is, I believe it was 2018, Microsoft released Tay. It was a, a chatbot that basically learned the vocabulary that other people were using. And then based on that, started to talk like people. And you would say, like, like the people that it was talking with. And you would think that this is a great idea. For example, as I mentioned, this way you can have an AI that talks similar to how um, immigrants are talking and it might make a chatbot that's much more friendly. What happened was that people started using Tay uh, to teach it na um, how Nazis were talking. Uh, it taught it that people taught it also how to, um, it, 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 learned, it learned a lot of racial slurs um, and it started to talk about Hitler, the Holocaust. And the problem was that Tay had no moral agency. So to this chatbot, words like Hitler or the Holocaust were no different from words as chair or Oklahoma. And so um, when you're designing and you're thinking about AI, it's very important that you consider that because of the probabilities that can exist where you have uncertainty, um, it can have certain errors. And also there can be as well errors and harms that emerge based on how people are appropriating and using the technology. Next slide. So what is a way in which you can start to combat some of these harms that can emerge from the AI. One thing is to think about the whole pipeline of the AI, that you have the data, you have the cleaning of the data, you have your AI models, you have how people are then using it. And throughout this whole process, you consider iterations. So for example, when you're training the data, it's important that you consider, hmm, did I integrate all of the, popu uh, all of the different populations? Likely what happened with Google was that it's AI system that was categorizing images. Maybe they just didn't work with people of color. And as a result, they never tested to see what happens with the photos of people of color. And so by having these types of iterations, you can improve your systems and you can identify when harms might emerge and you can make uh, certain interventions, you can identify better the solution before you generate the actual harm. Similarly with Tay, for example, um, they had tested their tool first on WeChat and they didn't have any problem. And But then they tested their tool, they deployed their tool then in the wild on Twitter. Now Twitter is a very different environment than WeChat and that resulted in those particular harms. Next slide, please. So. Overall, right now, uh, we went through a little bit about the pipeline of AI and how things can go wrong. And we also started to discuss about certain measures that we can accomplish. Now we're going to hear about, well, now in your everyday job, how might you uh, start to think about AIs, particularly in government? Um, so now I'm going to share, I've been working with different federal governments in Latin America. I'm originally from Mexico. so. I have uh, connections with different government actors there where I have been creating AI for them. Next slide, please. So the first one is um, technologies that I designed with Mexico's ministry, Mexico City's Ministry of Women. They have centers that focus on giving um, follow up and support to victims of domestic violence. Next slide, please. And so here, what we did was that we created 
dashboards, intelligent dashboards that use the data to find patterns about um, which parts of the city were with um, maybe most women that were experiencing domestic violence. And we were helping now the government workers to be able to provide better follow up to these to these women of uh, victims of domestic violence, give them better follow up and then also identify cases where the government worker was feeling overwhelmed with her job because maybe she was exposed to a number of highly critical cases of domestic violence and so they needed breaks and so here we're we're using the ai to make predictions about which victims of domestic violence likely need a, a much thorough follow-up and also using the ai to predict when these government workers need now support and a need, for example, their bosses, their managers to go help them and provide them with better well-being. Um, and so this is an example of how AI can be directly integrated into the government. Next slide, please. Another example is something that we did with Mexico's Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Here, um, we found that there were a number of government workers that were giving support to citizens, responding their questions, but um, a lot of the questions were always very repetitive. And so we integrated chatbots, AI based chatbots that the government worker could then delegate a number of questions and the government worker could focus on questions that were more complicated and that they needed their uh, a lot of their cognitive ability. Notice that here the difference with, for example, maybe how a lot of uh, big tech companies are thinking about this problem is that we're not interested in replacing the government worker. We're more interested in thinking about how do we enhance the work of the government worker by allowing them to focus on the more complex tasks, the tasks maybe that require their creativity. For example, um, a task that they might delegate to the chatbot is, hey, what time does does the Ministry of Foreign Affairs open? That, that's something that they can just easily delegate to the chatbot um, because it's a very repetitive question. But a question about, hey, um, I got divorced, my, uh, my son uh, is uh, maybe transitioning and I need a passport uh, for him, uh, what, what next steps do you recommend? Um, and so here you need a human to be able to go through all of the documents in detail, provide a detailed analysis, and a response. Um, and so this, these are cases where you want the human worker and you want them to be focused and to start to delegate work to the um, AI that's more um, simple in nature so that they can focus on those complex tasks that need human reasoning. Next slide, please. Um, and so overall, that's an overview of um, my little course on uh, AI for you guys, which I hope was useful. Um, remember, a key thing is to think about how do you mitigate the harms that the AI can be generating, but then also thinking about how do you integrate the AI, for example, within governments, within different sectors, so that you're empowering people instead of replacing them. Thank you. And thank you so much, Josh, for the invitation to be here. Thank you so much, Professor Savage. Um, and we're going to go ahead and, uh, and ask some questions here. Um, you know, I want to just quote uh, some, well, some AI experts and what they've recently said about the technology. Um, quote, this is unquestionably going to be the most radical transformation in our lifetimes. Uh, others have called AI the biggest economic phenomenon of our lifetimes. So you all three um, are, are working in the field. You're seeing what's happening. Uh, I'm just curious if you agree with that. I, Professor uh, Boyd Graber, you, maybe you can start because you, you know, you said there's been these moments uh, of attention to AI in the past. Are, are we in a different moment today? So I think um, my take on this um, is uh, borrowed from Rodney Brooks. And so he made a good insight that uh, when a new technology emerges, people typically overestimate the short-term consequences and underestimate the long-term consequences. And I, I think that's going to be true here. I, I, I think that we're not going to have tectonic shifts um, in, in, in the short term. Um, people will, after they get over the initial hype, um, there will be integration of this technology. We're already seeing it. It will be a useful tool, but it, it won't completely um, uh, shake up society in the next six months. Um, but I, I think that especially for people 
in legislators and thinking about governance, you, you need to look uh, 10, 15 years out where the real changes and the real challenges will be because you need to start uh, creating the environment for those to be healthy changes uh, and, and to uh, make that change a healthy one for society. And uh, this isn't going to be like uh, the rise of the automobile or electrification where uh, it will take a long time to roll out and um, the government will kind of be in charge of how that happens. Uh, I, I think that um, it can be ha happening faster than that because a lot of it is in the private sector and we need to think about that in responsible ways. And Hothan, what, what do you th say about that? I I would um, kind of double down on, on what Professor Boyd Graeber said, but I would say um, there was this great article, uh, The Lunch with the FT, with the sci-fi writer Ted Chiang, where he said, he, he referred to this tweet that said, um, you know, what is artificial intelligence? And the response was a poor choice of words in the 1960s, you know, a better term was applied statistics. Um, and I thought that was quite, quite insightful. Um, but I will say, I think what's different or interesting about this particular time is the way that it's impacting the economy, um, you know, even if it's not necessarily like electricity or these other, you know, you know extremely um, generative technologies, it's, it's that it's not in just one part of the economy, it's, it's really affecting all the parts of the economy. And that's what these kind of generative new AI technologies are doing in a way that I think um, we haven't seen before. So there is something that's, you know, different and, and novel about them. Professor Savage? I think one key thing, uh, and this relates a little bit to what uh, Omar, uh, Dr. Omar and uh, Professor uh, Jordan mentioned is, right now we are the first generation that we have AI systems making decisions that humans used to take. And so, for example, we might have, um, we, this, is, this is actually true, we've had, uh, for example, uh, police uh, stations that are integrating AI to make decisions about where they are going to do certain policing. Um, as a result, or for example, who might get sentenced uh, a certain amount of years, uh, given certain data that judges now have. Given that these decisions uh, about sentencing and who is going to be, pol which neighborhoods are going to be policed more than others, they used to be made by humans. Given that now we have machines, AI-based machines that are making these decisions, it's critical that we get things right. It's critical that we identify where harms can exist. Uh, yeah, no, thank you for that. And um, there have also been um, voices out there saying, hey, let's, uh, let's pause AI uh, development for six months and uh, Others are saying that, you know, this is going to destroy the earth um, at some point. And uh, yeah, I um, do you think, uh, you know, some of us are old enough to remember Y2K and, uh, you know, and all the worries around that. Um, but uh, Hothan, what, what, do you think that AI will eventually uh, destroy the earth or, or, or is this some of this uh, just silly? I think it, well, on the, on the destroying civilization, um, I'm not opposed to some level of, you know, consideration, you know, anything can happen in this world. My, I mean, my personal take is um, I tend to be a skeptical person, so I, I'm relatively skeptical. I, but I think, you know, um, I, I think it's it's really about what should policymakers be prioritizing and, and, you know, for our audience, what is it that they should be prioritizing? I think if there is not yet um, kind of empirical evidence that this is something that should be at the top of the list. You know, I, I think the claim that this is on par with nuclear, um, you know, weapons or pandemics. Um, I think that there are certainly holes in, in that in, in that sort of argument. Um, and also for our audience, even thinking about the six month pause, um, I think staffers um, can maybe better understand. You know, I'm also relatively new to the country, but even I, a few years in Washington, see that things move relatively slowly. Um, and so if we're going to have a six month pause, what is it that's really even going to happen in that time? You know, it's more about the, uh, you know, taking a proposal and thinking about, you know, how um, reasonable is this? What is it that policy can really do in those six months? Um, what is it that, that policymakers should be doing? Uh, great, I appreciate that. And I, I do want to bring in some questions that came in from our audience. Um, I got a couple questions. Um, that I'm going to try to combine here. Uh, one dealt with the possibility of AI misuse 
you know, academic cheating and professional plagiarism and wondering if like a database of AI materials could be formed. Uh, another dealt with uh, the EU AI Act and, and the idea of watermarking AI. Um, so, um, you know, are there ways we should be, uh, you know, I, I'll, let me just add also that uh, a lot of members of Congress are concerned about AI in campaign commercials, which has already happened, by the way. But um, yeah, Professor uh, uh, Boyd Graber, uh, are there good ways to identify AI, um, you know, so, so people aren't tricked? Uh, so um, uh, my colleague, uh, Tom Goldstein at the University of Maryland has, and and also Sohel Felsey also at the University of Maryland have, have done some really nice work about this. And so it is possible if you have uh, the, the providers of those AI systems on board um, to, to watermark uh, these sorts of uh, outputs, uh, the outputs need to be relatively large. Um, but like this seems to be like a, a really reasonable uh, place for some sort of uh, legislation. Um, of, of course, it won't be 100%. Uh, there, there's uh, people, uh, because we have this great open source environment, people can build their own, but that's going to be the exception rather than the rule. Um, and, and so we shouldn't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. And I guess as an academic, um, I, I think that there, there's also a challenge here um, that you, you you can't depend on on these tools, and and we will need to kind of rethink some of the norms around how we deal with creativity, and um, and especially in the classroom. I I, I think that so I personally uh, have uh, uh, started using assignments where people need to debunk um, the the things generated by uh, ChatGPT, figure out what's wrong with it, and kind of interact with it in in the way that you would in the real world. Uh, and to ask, uh, figure out what kinds of questions you could ask ChatGPT that it can't answer. And, and so I, I think a little bit of creativity goes a long way there as well. Great. And uh, we're getting tight on time. So I'm going to ask uh, one more question and maybe Professor Savage, um, you know, um, there's a, there's a uh, bipartisan consensus that we don't want to lose the AI race uh, to China. I'm just curious um, on your campuses at Northeastern and, and University of Maryland, um, you know, are there are, are your uh, institutions uh, starting are giving more um, resources to AI? Are there students uh, uh, lining up to take classes on this? I'm just curious about um, college campuses and and where the emphasis is. And Professor Savage, we do have a lot more courses now around AI. I think that there's a lot of value and identifying how you can design AI for underrepresented underrepresented and underserved populations, which a lot of the times big tech um, has not cared about. And that I would say is also, that could also be our competitive advantage um, that we get from other countries. Uh, for example, we could argue that we would be creating uh, AI systems that are now going to be helping the US workforce instead of repla uh, replacing them. And so thinking about, okay, how do we help uh, homeless people to use AI to be able to access new types of jobs? And I think there's a lot of opportunity in that space, it, particularly given that big tech, maybe much of the time, it's not even interested in studying and helping these populations. Um, and so that this is a little bit of a, a direction that right now we're going at uh, at Northeastern. Thank you, great question. Great, anything you wanna add, Professor Boyd Graber? Uh, I, I, I guess one thing that I would mention is that I, I think that we are going to need to rethink some of the ways that we do funding around AI because things are moving so quickly um, and the grant review cycles are so long that um, uh, yeah, if you, you know, I had a very annoying experience of like writing a grant proposal, chat GPT comes out and then the reviewers say, well, this is completely, uh, out of date now. Um, and so, uh, if technology is going to be moving quickly, uh, we need to perhaps rethink our, our funding agencies. And that's only something that can come from Congress. Um, and I, I think that might, uh, help us be more competitive. Appreciate it. Um, okay, thank you for those uh, for those great questions uh, out there. And um, I'm going to go ahead and, and quickly turn this back over to to Josh Landau, uh, who's just going to give us a sneak peek on the uh, the paper that uh, that he's publishing. Go ahead, Josh. Yeah, and I will say for all of, especially for all of the Hill staffers, although this offer is open to anyone who's on this call, 
uh, some of those questions and be more than happy to talk through sort of the, the policy perspective CCIA has on some of them. But to the, the white paper, today we released our white paper on AI regulation. It'll be circulated to you after this call, I think, or it might've been circulated during the call. And uh, I think there's a slide up now, but if there isn't, Gary, could you bring it up? Just, I wanna quickly run through the main points. I, I'm looking forward to talking with all of you about your ideas so that we can make sure the US has the best re regulatory framework that'll let us continue to lead in AI innovation, but make sure as Professor Savage said that AI advancements are safe and responsible and that they do benefit everybody. In many places, existing laws are already going to address the concerns posed by AI. We don't need a new AI discrimination law. We have AI, oh, sorry, we have a discrimination law. It applies to AI. There was the recent letter from uh, Chairman Khan and, uh, and from DOJ, from uh, AG Cantor, pointing out that the existing authorities do apply. Fraud is fraud, whether an AI does it or a human does it. And we shouldn't care whether a person or a computer is doing some harmful behavior. We should have a law that covers it in either case. In the instances where AI introduces a new or a unique challenge or where there's a particularly high risk, we might need additions to existing law and regulation. But a lot of this can be handled through a responsible development framework. And this is sort of the synthesis. There are a lot of uh, responsible AI frameworks out there. So we decided to add to the morass and put out another one. But this is our synthesis of sort of what everybody agrees in leading AI developers, leading researchers, CCIA's members. What would we do? So we should design for social benefit. We should design to avoid unfair outcomes, to avoid discrimination in the uh, system itself. As you design, you need to analyze the risks and you need to try to minimize them. It's going to be impossible to eliminate risk entirely, but you should absolutely know what they are and try to make sure that they're as small as possible. And consider the risks to third parties. So an AI might be between the, the developer of the AI and the user, but it will have impacts on third parties but also consider the benefits that that'll bring to other third parties. Um, some of the examples that Professor Savage was talking about of, you know, probably the homeless population is not going to be involved in the development of these systems. You would hope they would, but they're a hard population to reach for a lot of reasons. But you do wanna make sure that the system is going to benefit them if it potentially could. You also need to use your up-to-date safety, security and privacy best practices. So one example here is the idea of a, a database of all AI outputs, that's a security and privacy nightmare if somebody ever breaches that. And we know that data breaches happen even with the, the best of intention. So that's sort of a situation where there might be benefits on the side of, de of uh, detecting when an AI has been misused, but the harms are really considerable in the safety and security space. And once you've deployed an AI, this responsible development is part of it, but you have to make sure that you're monitoring and governing risks once you've deployed it. Uh, Tay is a good example. If Microsoft had just said, okay, it's out there and we're not going to pay any attention to it, uh, it would have gone very badly. It's good that they pulled it back because they did monitor how it was being used. And finally, you should provide appropriate disclosures for a deployed AI system. And this isn't necessarily you have to disclose any case where AI is used. There are going to be cases where it's being used in sort of behind the scenes and flagging to a human for a decision where there might not need to be any disclosure because a human is ultimately monitoring it. There are other situations where you would absolutely want AI disclosure and it's going to be contextual. So comprehensive regulation of AI needs to employ a risk-based framework. You need to look at the context of the application and that'll help you understand what appropriate safeguards are. So NIST recently released an AI framework that does exactly this, that uses a risk-based approach. An application with a higher impact probably can't tolerate as much risk and is going to require much more robust guardrails. And transparency and disclosure are crucial aspects to make sure that people can trust the AI systems that they're interacting with. Though at the same time, we need to make sure that we're protecting private information, proprietary knowledge, confidential business information. So again, there needs to be a, a balance of transparency and disclosure. One of the big questions is gonna be who regulates? Uh, some people have floated the idea of a standalone agency, a, a department of AI. I think that would be like having a department of computing. AI is gonna be too integrated into too many areas of our entire society for it to really make sense to have it centralized in that way. Instead, CCI thinks that AI experts within the existing agencies that help those agencies enforce their roles would make the most sense. For example, an AI expert in HHS is going to help them enforce roles regarding AI in healthcare settings. That doesn't mean that we don't need some sort of coordination that could be housed in NIST, it could be a function of OSTP. 
it could even be, a, uh, as much as I hate to use the IPSR as a model, it could be something like the IPSR. That would help us reduce regulatory duplication, but still make sure that the overall AI regulatory space is coordinated. And I do want to mention regulatory duplication because I don't want to see a situation, we don't want to see a situation where we rush to create an AI specific law and all of a sudden we have a situation where there's some sort of legal advantage to doing something by human action or by an AI. That's not ideal, but again, the outcome is really the key. Uh, and that provides regulatory arbitrage and that's going to focus efforts in unhelpful ways. You're going to wind up with people saying, oh, I can get an advantage by doing this through AI and overdeveloping in a space that probably shouldn't have been developed as hard or vice versa. They'll say, I can't use AI for this because I just, there are too many disadvantages. And then an area that really could have been beneficial won't get development. All that said, regulation is going to play a vital role in engendering trust in AI systems. We need clear guidelines and standards to address concerns related to privacy, to bias, to accountability. But an overly prescriptive approach that sets the law in stone based on a, a current generation of AI technology is going to be a problem. Uh, one example is ECBA, which was written when uh, computing was in a very different place. It assumed that you know you would it didn't understand that the cloud would come to be a thing, the cloud email would be a thing, and assumed that nobody would store their email on a server for more than 180 days. That's crazy. Well, that's the world we live in. And it's been a huge problem uh, since my time in the Senate more than a decade ago. That was something we were talking about, and it's still out there. So we don't want to have law set in stone, a prescriptive approach that depends on exactly what we have now. We need flexibility. So again, I hope this was a good preview of our white paper. I'm more than happy to discuss it in more detail after you've had a chance to look at it or any of your other questions. And I'd be happy to talk about AI regulation in general. Uh, and thank you again for your time today and for attending. I'm going to send it back to the other Josh. Uh, thank you, Josh. And uh, yeah, the, the CCI white paper is available at the event right page for this event, uh, and we'll be circulating it. Um, I just want to add quickly, I was very pleased with uh, Majority Leader Schumer's AI presentation last week. Uh, and he said, and I quote, the first issue we must tackle is encouraging, not stifling innovation. Um, and I, uh, I really want to thank uh, Everyone uh, that joined the panel today, uh, Professor Savage and Boyd Graber uh, and Hotha, uh, Josh, thank you all. I, I certainly learned a lot. And um, most of all, thanks to the congressional staff that were able to, to join us. Uh, please uh, reach out if you have questions. And uh, thank you so much. Uh, really appreciate it. Take care.